Welcome everyone. This is our free mind body skills group, which is a skills uh, setting group that we want to build our emotional resilience together as a com community. So tonight we have Janie as our presenter. This is the part two of uh, our in intergenerational trauma series. So um, who, for whoever attended last week, last Tuesday night, you might already got to know who Janie is. So I'm just going to read a little bit about um, Janie, the short bio here. Uh, in case you haven't um, um, attended last Tuesday. So Janie is a strong indigenous woman from the Wasakan First Nation Reservation. She's married and an, an amazing mother of two. Janie has devoted her life to serving others. She's currently studying to be an addictions and mental health counselor with the goal of opening a wellness center to serve the needs of indigenous people on her reservation. She has an immense amount of life experience, which allows her to connect with individuals on a deeper understanding. And we're so fortunate to have her with us today. So without further ado, here's Janie. <laughs> Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Ani and Bozo, hello and welcome. My spirit name is Sange Tagasi Makwa, strong voice bear. You can call me Janie. Today's topic, indig Indigenous Intergenerational Trauma, is near and dear to my heart. I am Ojibwe from Wasasing First Nations. My father is Native. Intergenerational trauma is very prevalent amongst the Indigenous population. I'm facilitating this workshop in hopes of spreading awareness through education. I myself am a survivor of intergenerational trauma. I'm still learning about my culture and reconnecting to my roots. I was not taught very much about my indigenous background and that might be because of the trauma my indigenous family endured. Nonetheless, I'm glad you are all a part of this journey with me tonight. Let's get started. So on tonight's agenda, we're gonna do the, that was the introduction. Who are the indigenous people of Canada? What is intergenerational trauma? What is historical generational trauma? Historical trauma indigenous people have endured. What are the effects of intergenerational trauma? How to heal and grow from the intergenerational trauma? Breaking the cycle. What can Canadians do to help? Indigenous commemorative and awareness days. And then closing. So here's intergenerational trauma part two the Indigenous population of Canada. Who are the Indigenous people of Canada? In Canada, the term Indigenous peoples or Aboriginal peoples refer to the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. These are the original inhabitants of the land that is now Canada. So these are just some symbols that dictate like this, the First Nations, Métis and there's the Inuit. Intergenerational trauma, sometimes considered transgenerational trauma, is a term that is used to describe the impact of a traumatic experience, not only one generation, but on subsequent generations after an event. What is historical generational trauma? So we touched basis on this in the first part of intergenerational trauma. Does anybody recollect or have any idea of what historical generational trauma is? Don't be shy, Crystal, I know you know. James, James has his hand up. Oh, sorry, I, I don't see hands up. Sorry, um, I apologize, you know, I didn't know. Yeah, James. Stand up in the camera. I, was, I was just gonna say that it's uh, something that is, I guess, a, uh, uh, yeah, traumatic event that's passed down through generations to different different family members like through different family members and stuff yes correct um can i add to that most definitely um so i guess it's um 
like it's it's trauma that occurred like not just in the past like generations before but is also a, an event that is still occurring in the present day most definitely so that's an important aspect as well so here we have historical generational trauma is a trauma experienced by a group with a history of suffering from systematic oppression, more specifically known as genocide. Sorry, I'm having issues. Historical trauma the indigenous peoples have endured. A legacy of chronic trauma and unresolved grief across generations enacted on the indigenous peoples by the European dominant culture for the last 500 years. Indigenous people have been subjected to traumas that have resulted in specific historical losses. These losses include loss of people, loss of land, loss of family, and loss of culture. During the European colonization, 90% of the indigenous population declined. 55 million lives were eliminated. The decline can be explained by two main factors. The genocide, which is the intentional killing of indigenous people and exposure to European disease. Natives were purposely exposed to the, these diseases, such as used blankets exposed to smallpox in an attempt to subdue the First Nations resistance. So in my opinion, that looks as though that's genocide. <laughs> um, definitely. Yeah, right? I would definitely agree with you in that sense of uh, um, explanation. I mean, you know, and especially with young children, you wouldn't imagine that our, you know, that our young children would be victims of such cruelties yeah, it's really hard to wrap your mind around. Indigenous peoples were prohibited from practicing traditional ceremonies, unable to mourn their losses, leaving this population and subsequent generations left with feelings of shame, powerless, and subordination. The law was only lifted in 1978 when the American and Indigen Indian Religious Freedom Act was enacted. When lands of the indigenous people were taken, they were forced onto reservations. These lands were not suitable for agriculture and hunting. And as a result, native men were unable to provide for their families and they became dependent on goods provided by the government. So what sticks out to me so much is 1978. Could you imagine being in a position where you lost a loved one, a loved one was killed and you are unable to have closure, um, I, I, it's just devastating. So that really stands out because 1978 isn't a very long time ago at all. Yeah, our parents were alive then and some of us here might've been alive then, then too. Like it's within this generation that is alive and well today. It's, I can't believe it either. Like to, to deny a whole population the right to mourn family members who have passed away it's just so unbelievable like it's so inhumane it really is so one of the most devastating traumas that occurred to the indigenous people was residential schools indigenous children were, for were forcefully removed from their families as young as three and not allowed any contact with their families for a minimum of eight years in these boarding schools, these children had their hair cut, dressed like Europeans, all sacred items taken away, forbidden to use their native language, practice rituals or religions. A number was assigned to these children and that is how they were addressed, not by their given names. Many children were abused, physically, sexually, beaten, raped, starved and killed. The agenda by the government churches an organization was to save the child and kill the Indian. And this picture is a depiction of that. Yeah, and in, in, um, and in some uh, records, it also indicates that, um, that the children were stripped of their uh, indigenous name and given um, a uh, Christian name. Yes, forced religion 
there, sure. there is, is so much into this topic that you could make a whole presentation for days just on residential schools. Um, so there's definitely probably a lot of things that are missing and based on school location, things could have been different, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. The last residential school was closed in 1996. Um, I know that with the social media and everything going on within the indigenous population, this has come to light. Um, but it's just, you know, a lot of times people are like, why don't you just get over it or move on and this and that, but 1996, that's just unbelievable. Hey, Jeez, I, I remember that year. Hey, Janie, I think uh, Tony has a question. He's got his hand up. I don't know if you can see it or not. I just thought I'd let you know. Uh, no, I don't see, but um, sure, Tony. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, um, that saved the child Again, the government agenda saved the child and killed the oh. Indian. Is that is that um, a cover up agenda? Is that is that a true agenda? Because I'm I'm tending it's more of a a political statement to for for leverage of what they really were trying to do, as far as you know, gaining resources and and controlling those resources. I don't think they had any problem taking the resources that they wanted to. Um, it was a it was a part of the assimilation to uh, save these children and you know change them into a European way of living. Um, the 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 Indian the parents there was no hope for them. So uh, this is why they took these children forcefully from the families and put them in these institutes and, you know, taught them English, give them English names, um, you know, forced religion upon them so that they could, you know, be this whole Euro European dominant. So, and, and, and the other thing that we, um, we also know is that in, in that time um, when this uh, movement was happening, um, the government was highly run by the church. Exactly. Yeah, the what? church had a lot of power. Like it, it the was church like had a lot of influence the, on the government yeah. decisions in that and, time and power. Yeah, like it was through the church that they used that agenda. They they used in the name of religion to cleanse ethnically cleanse the indigenous population. Yeah, it's a huge contradiction as far as religion goes, but but weren't weren't they weren't they released at age sixteen from the schools and then set to go on their own, knowing with no without any money, knowing perfectly no, well eight, until eighteen. Was it eighteen? See, Phoebe yeah. has her hands up. Yeah, I was just. I I think when you remove. Um, someone's pride or their sense of um belonging or you know like losing Dignity. any kind of yeah. when, when when you remove so removing the like the children from their parents uh, then they and 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 making them european let's say um if they're if it's the best way to really erase the history and the pride and it's the best way to like kind of um it's it's really like how they they are so people won't fight and revolt you know what i mean like if you do that if if you remove any kind of like sense of pride or memory then then those children won't revolt against the new system i understand what you're saying well, especially if shame was used if yeah, shame is used like you know like the children were were taught to be ashamed of who they were and disgusted by who they were and when so that, those are tools that are are used then yeah it it's definitely what you're saying um it's easy to control them i guess yeah absolutely because then you won't revolt because you have no pride no voice you know, your voice is taken yeah. away. Yeah, no pride in who you so were. What's yeah, being right. said here, ultimately, they're 
the the agenda seems to to suppress the population, not help the not help the child at all. It suppressed the population uh, just to have control. So there is no aggression against what they're trying to do and ultimately have the corporations go in there and, and do what they want without public attention of what they're doing to the people and saying, this is all legitimate. We're the good guys. We're helping the people. Meanwhile, they would know perfectly well they're not helping the people releasing them at, at 18 years old without any money, without really anywhere to go. Um, and, no and identity. Putting them in a, a, like an oppressed society where they really don't have a chance. So I, I, I really, you know, I don't trust the governments. Um, um, and I really think there's, there's, there was other in, intentions um, other than saving the saving the child because the, ch the children aren't they're not no. really being saved. No. They're being no, they're of being... course. Saving the child was just the the cover, like you said before, um, uh, that it was just a cover up used by the church to cover up the true agenda of which was ethnic cleansing and mm -hmm. apartheid for sure. Exactly, exactly. to yeah. strip them of their identity, as uh, Amina said. It was oppression and ethnic cleansing at its worst. Some great comments in the chat box there. Um, and Janie, if I can, just to put, put it into perspective for individuals that may not um, have that full information about residential schools. Does anybody know, like we know the date of the last residential school. Do we know what, what where the location? Does anybody know that? Before I give the answer. Yeah, that, that, was, that was in uh, Bradford. Yeah, in Bradford, right here. In Bradford, it was actually in the Six Nations, um, on the Six Nations Reserve, and I had the, um, I want to say that it was an honor, um, because of the fact that, of the stories that I learned there, um, but it was really an eerie experience to actually be able to go and walk through those hallways and walk in the spaces where these individuals slept and to hear the stories that these, um, some of these survivors had. And I'm sorry, I sound so emotional because every time I tell this story, um, it brings in such emotion. And one story in particular, um, just to bring it down to the cruelty um, that was happening in these schools is that not only were these children molested, um, and molested during times that they were in their development into womanhood and became pregnant. And instead of allowing these new lives to breathe and to try and survive in a, this society, they were either buried alive or they were put in gas in in the fireplaces the furnaces in in the schools and burnt while their mothers cried and this is the type of cruelty that that you've seen that that were experienced in these schools young men that were stripped of their pride and made to do things that they would normally do forced to do it's very heartbreaking to know some of these stories Thank you very much, Crystal, for sharing. I I know that it, it the content can be very triggering, and you know if anyone needs a minute, just step away, do what you need to do. Um, but this is a part of what needs to happen, um, and a part of the beginning of healing is to feel that pain. And yes, so this is definitely something that will not be forgotten and a part of history that needs to be no. I yeah. just want to say something if you don't mind not at all yes so um crystal we are right here with you with that emotion it will never go away each time we remember and watch the news about this it will never leave our minds you know why because even though the government came the other day and said he's paying money, they can't pay enough. Can they bring back a life from what they destroyed? Never. The money yeah. is not good. 
No, and you know, right? um, Six Nations, they, they, you know, made the decision to keep the school erect as a reminder of the um, cruelty that was mm. put upon their people. And they use it as a, as a museum now where you can actually book a tour and go through there and get, um, you know, stories and be told the stories and actually walk those hallways and um, walk at the, around the building and see um, the names of some of the children where they etch their names into the buildings. Mm. It's very spectacular. So much. Mm. Thank you for sharing your vulnerability with us, Crystal. Um, we're going to move on from the residential schools. Like I said, we could do hours upon hours on this topic. So when those who live through the original trauma have not had a chance to heal from it, their children and grandchildren are likely to feel the effects of trauma, despite not going through the traumatic experience firsthand. Oftentimes, the, the survivors maladaptive behaviors and patterns transmit trauma to later generations unknowingly and have not had the chance to heal. In many cases, the trauma is too overwhelming. Over time, destructive behaviors and mental states become normalized, leading to future generations suffering. Their pain might manifest in addictions, physical and mental illness, contributing to the destructive behaviors long after the initial trauma took place. What are the effects of intergenerational trauma? So the list is honestly endless. There's the psychological distress aspect of the trauma, you know, relating to the substance abuse, insomnia, aggression, risky behavior, anxiety, PTSD, mood disorders, low self-esteem. It's an endless list. There's psychological concerns. Life expectancy of an Indigenous person is 20 years less than the other populations. Lower health status, discrimination in the health services, heart disease, diabetes, sexually transmitted diseases, tuberculosis. Um, there's also the social environmental concerns, domestic violence, overrepresented within the criminal justice system, physical and sexual assault, child abuse, overrepresented in the child care protective services, lack of education, double unemployment rates, live in poverty, murdered missing indigenous women. So here's a question. What can be done if you are a survivor of intergenerational trauma? Does anybody have any suggestions, ideas? I strongly just, Sorry. I strongly, Sorry, I strongly Mina. believe in, and I'm um, just speaking about it. Um, not only like, not only with therapists or whatnot, but just speak about it with your family, speak about it in public, bring awareness to it. Mm -hmm. And keep educating yourself about it, you know, never stop by just like, okay, you read a little something and then think you know it all because it goes really deep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have uh, someone in the chat that said uh, seeking therapy and, um, you know, talking about it. I just, myself, I just put it in the comment. It's, you know, sharing stories um, like the one that I shared with you all um, a little while ago. Um, it's as difficult as these stories are to voice and as emotional we, we can get with them it's important for us to share them, to voice them so that we can educate others in order to allow them to understand and be supportive. Because if they don't, un if people don't understand why someone is drinking or why someone has, is abusive or why, um, you know, maybe their kids aren't understanding them, it's important to get down to that root cause and to get those backstories and understand that this is, this is what could be affecting you and, and to break that cycle within your family. And that's just it. There's a lot of stigmas, you know, that go with the being indigenous or Aboriginal. You're, you're drunk, right? You're, you're living off of free money. All of these, these 
ideas and it's it, it, they're just so incorrect when you're looking at someone a population that does have a high addictions rate why is that what are the underlying causes nobody is born an alcoholic nobody wakes up and says i want to be an alcoholic so like it's a matter of taking that time and and being compassionate and caring and educating yourself and understanding where this population is coming from the history behind behind everything because if you don't understand the history you you definitely aren't going to understand the present mm -hmm. absolutely Janie okay so we have here breaking the cycle this is this is key this is very very important because as we've learned about intergenerational trauma it just keeps going around through generation to generation but it seems simple right not so much how to break the cycle of intergenerational trauma and heal a broken population so these are all different forms of therapy that focus on intergenerational trauma um and they're so very they're very helpful like you know the child child parent relationship therapy the culture informed treatment this is a very important form of of therapy to help reconnect indigenous with their culture that they've lost to help them find their identity again this is very helpful because a lot of people have lost that portion of who they are um so I, I really like that form of treatment. You know, there's the narrative exposure therapy, the intergenerational trauma treatment model, um, working through your genogram. That's like basically like a diagram and it's a like a family tree and it shows your traumas, the abuses, the mental illnesses and, and addictions like within your family, which then can also show you where your risk factors are um and this is like everybody from yourself to your grandparents like everybody's on this family tree um it's a little different than just putting the pictures up it's more so like a visual form to see you know all of those traumas and stuff that lie within your family tree um sometimes that helps um just to kind of get like if you're a visual learner i am so when i can see things on paper and how it's written out it gives me a better idea rather than just being overwhelmed in my mind. Um, share your story, giving trauma a voice within the family, open and honest communication, making meaningful connections, and be kind and patient with yourself. This is not something that's going to heal overnight. Um, so it's very important for you to just be kind and patient. Hey Jamie, uh? if you can give me one minute, I have a I have a uh, a lengthy comment here, but it's um it's something that I I think that needs to be shared. Okay. Uh, the um the comment comes from your daughter actually. It's coming from Samira. Um, the thing I hear the most is it happened in the past. It's done. It happened to you. It didn't happen to you, so it doesn't affect you. And they're half right. It didn't happen directly to me. And I could not even imagine nor fathom how lost they like how lost they felt. They felt. But it's crazy that the feelings of not knowing your identity, being stripped of your culture, and the constant doubt of self-worth are just some of the horrendous feelings my ancestors carried with them due to the genocide they faced. But what's even crazier is how this pain and unresolved trauma passed through generations. My name is Samira and I'm less than a quarter native. Hmm. I'm not sure what that means. That's what the government said. But all those hurt unresolved traumas do affect me today. I struggle with knowing who I am culturally, religiously and ethnically. My roots have been taken from not only me, but my family. Currently, my mother and I are working on learning our roots to break the cycle. Samira, let me tell you, young lady, I applaud you. Yeah, she just like, way to make me cry during a presentation. Right? <laughs> um, as I told you, baby girl, you don't need the government to dictate who you are. It's in your spirit, it's in your blood, 
And if, if you even let it get into your head, then you're just, you know, you're just allowing them to win. Um, being, no, I know that that was more so of like a, a smart comment. <laughs> you know, um, you know who you are and you don't need anybody to tell you otherwise. And I'll be there to remind you every step of the way. Okay. I remember you dancing on those powwow grounds and big daddies here. Like, I think it was eight hours straight, eight hours straight. You didn't stop. I could see it in your spirit. I don't need a government or a seven digit number for you to be, for you to know who you are. Um, but as you guys can see, this is my daughter and um, the government has, you know, told her, sorry, your blood quantum is not enough to be considered indigenous, to be considered native. So I understand where she feels that detachment. Um, and it's very unfortunate. And the comparison that I'd like to make is in the residential schools, they weren't identified by a name, but by a number. And here we are today in 2022 and you have to prove your blood quantum and then the government will issue a, you a number. What other population has to do such anything like that to prove anything? And no disrespect to anything else, but you can identify as who you wanna identify, but you have to go through endless paperwork to like prove who you are, who your ancestors are. I have people within my class currently who are indigenous and unable to find certain documents of their ancestors, of their grandparents. So because of that reason, the government is denying them. It's still a part of the assimilation and oppression that was always installed with the indigenous people and it's still ongoing. So this is just a matter of awareness uh, so that people know that this is what's going on and it's hard to heal within a population when you're fighting against something that's so powerful and you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, we have another comment in the chat um, from Jess. She says, my daughter is half native and she'll probably never get her status card either. But Samara, you and, your, you, you and her are indigenous. You know it in your hearts and that's all that matters. Don't let them colonize your heart. We, Very beautiful, Jessica. Beautiful comment. Thank you so much for that. So uh, you have two uh, hands up on the screen. I know there's a lot going on in this uh, presentation. Thank you. Maybe James, you can be my moderator for the night. <laughs> All right. So we got we got uh, Phoebe and we got Amina. I don't know okay, who would Phoebe. like to go first. We can hear from Phoebe, then Amina. Oh, hi, Janie. I, first hi. of all, I want to commend you um, because I think you are helping break um, generational trauma with what you're doing now and helping your daughter. Thank and you. I think being the cycle, like we're seeing, we're seeing some progress there with what you're doing. Thank you so much. That's it. <laughs> Amina? Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to say Samira, that's powerful, extremely powerful for a young lady. You've, you're, you're self identifying is out, out, you know, through the roof. And I, I like, I, I love that. Um, I just want to say, like, I can't imagine, um, not especially in this day and age, I can't imagine not knowing my roots and my culture and not being able to identify, not, not even just not knowing, but not being able to identify with, with something, you know, so where I come from. Um, that absolutely breaks my heart. Like even me being, being black and have going through, like we went through slavery and stuff. I still have a, you know, I still have an idea, you know, my, my dad did a, research and found our, our um, roots and all that stuff. But I just can't imagine in this day and age not being able to identify. And um, again, thank you so much for this because it needs to be talked about. And yeah, I am here as your sister and I stand in solidarity with, with all the indigenous people. You know, I wanna see change as well. It's beautiful. Thank you so much for that beautiful comma, comment, Amina. That's awesome. Oh. Oh. Turn pain into purpose. This is something that I've used in my life. And I feel like when you take something that has hurt you and it doesn't have to be intergenerational trauma, it can be something very traumatic, something that's, you know, holding you down, something that is just, you know, not letting you be your full potential and, and change your mindset about it. 
So yeah, what happened really hurts. Acknowledge it. That's fine. But how can you turn that into purpose? You know, maybe advocacy, maybe helping somebody out, um, doing something that makes you feel good about you. And it, it could be a simple act of volunteering or, you know, a donation, um, talking to your kids and educating them, teaching them. There's so many ways to turn your pain into progress, into purpose. For me, if I allow all my traumas and my past and stuff to take over, then it all goes in vain. But if I take it and learn lessons that came with it, um, what could I learn? What do I want better? And try to work on changes like that and focus my mindset so that I allow myself some freedom, you know, freedom from the pain, freedom from that trauma and, you know, able to move forward. So if anything tonight, if anybody's suffering and in pain and holding on to something, maybe just reflect on that. Like what kind of message is being sent to me and, and what can I learn? And how can I spin this around and make it into something purposeful? Okay. Well said. Thank you. So here, what can Canadians do to help? Like, what can we do to help the Indigenous people of Canada? Does anybody have any suggestions or ideas? We need to voice our what's we need to voice what's happened in our history. We need to share it because there's still people out there that don't comprehend it, and there's still people out there that are, you know, uh, ignorant to the fact of really what's going on and and the stigma um, yeah. around the community. Um, it's it's incredible. Um, it's it's really incredible. And, uh, you know, I, you know, many, many years ago, like I was around 1978 and uh, I was born in Thunder Bay uh, and there's still, there's still so much ignorance there um, after so many years um, of, and, and people are totally in the dark. They don't understand. So uh, I think, you know, now that stories have come out, now that, you know, admittance have, has come out. You know, now is the time to keep it going because, you know, the, the, the tragedy would be making this event uh, something that's hot topic and then gone like here today and gone tomorrow. Like that's, that's a, the, the, the tragedy um, of, of what has happened that we've recently, recently found out of what had happened and just continuing to share to share those stories because people need to not only know as a story, but need to really know what people went through. Because when you make it personal and people realize and, and, and feel the suffering that other, their, their, their you know, fellow man has gone through, that's when they're gonna get it. You know, that's when they're gonna get it. Otherwise, it's just another story. Very true, oh. very true, Tony. And we have a comment in the box here, empathize with those who are hurting. Um, one other thing and something that uh, is uh, uh, indicative of the indigenous culture is to um, receive things with an open heart, with an open mind, with open ears. And that means really take in the information and reflect on it before you make a judgment. Um. Thank you, guys. Um, one moment. So, um, we, Jane, we, got, we got two hands up. Yes. We got Amina. Thank you, moderator. Yes. No worries. <laughs> Sorry, that was actually from before, but I will take the opportunity to make a comment. Okay. Um, uh, the the awareness. I think just spreading awareness is so big. I remember when all this, all these um, mass graves are being found. I had a friend who had had no clue. Grew up in Canada, full full fledged Canadian, no clue about what the the residential schools were. When I broke it down to her a little bit, she's been studying it, she's been reading up on it. She 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 didn't know what it was, but she knew that she was hurting. Just the idea, just the idea of children not being able to make it home 
when I gave her that little bit, like she, she didn't understand what, what it all was about, but she was hurting. And that made her feel like she had to do something, you know, and that she had to learn and she had to spread awareness and she had to, you know, um, become one with, with, with the indigenous people. So um, I believe it's, it's working. It's working. Yeah, really hard when this was one of Canada's deepest dark secrets, right? It wasn't in history. You didn't learn anything factual about what was going on um within the in indigenous people you didn't you didn't learn anything so unless you actually knew an indigenous person and that person opened up to you and shared stories with you that would be the only way you would really know um other than that like I, I was surprised myself how many people actually were unaware of what had happened here in Canada so I feel like a great movement has started and it's great because it starts with education and awareness and that brings me to um, the next slide. So, how I can have, you excuse me? I have my hand up. <laughs> yes, <Jessica>. um, <laughs> thanks. So, I just wanted to say another way we can support um, the voices of the Indigenous population here in Canada, um, especially as non-Indigenous people, is to if we, if we, for example, if any of us own a small business or manage a business um, or even are an employee we can provide opportunities through our workspaces uh, to give platforms to our indigenous friends um, family members um, anyone we know who is indigenous who we can we can provide a platform for them to share their stories and honor their tradition of uh, oral sharing their oral history because they their oral uh, history tradition is to share their stories and have their stories be passed down and passed down and that's how they shared their history so we can honor that by providing them maybe through our workspaces or through like how healing connections is doing this right now is is healing connections has provided you Janie an opportunity to share this and spread awareness through the healing connections company which is a great opportunity for you and and the indigenous uh, communities to to share the history so that's another way <laughs> yeah and I just wanted to uh I just wanted to uh uh inform uh on a wider platform because a question came through the chat here and it says was it just canada or is it north american wide and it is north american wide um for sure but the suffering of indigenous peoples are suffered all around the world there's examples in australia with uh, the aborigines there mexico mayans so like that have similar histories it's it's definitely um you know, something that is a yeah, global, global worldwide, not I just uh, I do know like Southern Americas. Sorry, my dad had shared a story with the migration and they the indigenous people of Canada did come from America. Um, I don't know this whole entire story. As I said, this is a process of learning for me as well. So I stuck within the Canada um, and eventually I would like, you know, to edu educate myself further in terms of it as a whole. But as Crystal did say, Indigenous people around the world um, are suffering. Um, so those were all great, great suggestions. Um, be an ally. Ally is, ally is, is one. Educating yourself, knowing the history helps understand the legacy of trauma break and stop stigmas support the health and well-being of indigenous children and families using your knowledge to educate others fight racism when you see it advocate support our indigenous people as they continue to fight against the colonism including the ongoing policies that continue to perpetuate the inequalities that we have seen for many years and continue to see listen Attend a First Nations traditional event, like a powwow. Volunteer your time. Donate to reputable foundations supporting residential school survivors and their families, as well as all those, as those that provide food, shelter, and legal aid to First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities across the country. 
write a letter to your member of parliament asking the government to recognize and apply the UN's declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples, uh, like treaties and things that they, they constantly promise, but then just end up breaking those promises. Um, sorry, support indigenous artists and small businesses. So this is just to lighten things up a little bit. Um, this is, uh, is a powwow. So powwow is a traditional gathering uh, where, geez, pardon me, my fingers, sorry. Where there is individuals in the regalia, that's their traditional clothing. And then in that one picture, there's the drummers and they're singing songs, um, prayers, uh, ceremonies. It is a beautiful, wonderful um, celebration to be a part of, and anybody is welcome to these events. Um, they have like all these shops set up where people make their um, homemade stuff. Uh, you can get a taste of different foods, and mostly you get to dance and, you know, have great conversations with people. Um, it wasn't until I think my first powwow that I had went to, and at this point in time in my life, I didn't really know what being native was. I didn't really even know if I knew what it was. And I think I was about like maybe eight, nine, 10 ish. And I went to a powwow with my aunt Vera was there and my cousins and she took my hand and we started to dance and I didn't know where I was, what I was doing, but all I know is that my spirit felt whole and I felt connected. And there was just something about that moment that stuck with me until today. Um, and it, it was then that I knew that I needed to learn more about my culture that I felt so, so, I don't know, so passionate about and I didn't know anything. And at that this point in time in my life in the 80s, when you said, oh, I'm native, there were these stigmas attached with that. And um, people would say derogatory things and stuff. And I didn't understand it. And I personally didn't care either. I always stood proud of being part Indigenous. Um, so very proud. Like I always had my head up high and despite what anybody had to say just because the feeling that I had inside was so much more powerful than what the outside world was saying. Um, hopefully COVID is gone this year and so you guys can all participate in within a powwow and you know just get a feeling of the culture. It's it's a really great experience. Yeah, I usually take my daughter to powwows every year, as many powwows as I can find. Like they usually, they're usually on in the summertime, like June, July, and August. Yes. And like, I usually take her from powwow to powwow, like all summer, but we haven't been in like two years because of COVID. We've been like so sad. But yeah, like I just want to say to everyone, if you go to a powwow, bring lots of money with you. Because uh, as Janie was saying, there's all these like stalls set up like around the the grounds so and it's they all they all come down from like their communities and and and, and re reservations with their homemade stuff and mm -hmm. and you want to support them at the same time right so spend as much money as you can I just love everything that they make I like everything beaded and homemade is just I absolutely love it but my ultimate goal is to go to um the powwow in Winnipeg and if COVID is not here this uh, coming sun, summer, I am going to make that journey. Um, awesome journey. Yeah, oh my gosh, I would love it. So I have a couple of people that have um, information and questions uh, in the chat. Okay. Uh, Danielle, thank you so much. Somebody, uh, Danielle uh, wrote down that there is actually um, through indigenous services at uh, Constantoga College, um, there's a virtual uh, power that's happening on March 26th. So if you guys want to check that out, check uh, Conestoga uh, College's uh, website for that. Um, and <laughs> he was wondering where we can get access to upcoming powwows. Literally do a Google search. I know that in Toronto alone, they usually hold um, one at the one point, uh, 
There's usually one at Fort York. Uh, during uh, Indigenous Week, they usually hold a powwow um, or celebrations of some sort at um, Nathan Phillips Square. Um, but literally try and, and just search out um, reserves that are close to your area and, and check their calendars for their upcoming powwows and make sure that they're open ones because some, sometimes uh, there are some communities that do have closed powwows just for the community. Um, but they always hold annual ones that people are welcome to join. So I would I would just uh, do a quick Google search and see, you know, powwows in your area. You're most welcome to come to the Wasasing First Nations. They normally hold theirs in August, but like I said, it's been a couple of years because of COVID um, that they've been, they haven't had them. And it's, it's so sad because I really miss them. Uh, but yeah, if you Google powwows, um, sometimes there's powwow trails, like um, where, where the powwows are being held and where to go for them. And people will travel all over to attend um, powwow. So it's actually really amazing. Just keep your eye open um, and ear open when it gets closer to um, spring, like May-ish. And we also had a question. Um, somebody said, I want to try some indigenous food. What is a traditional food? Hey, okay. Okay. I'm sorry, that, that was me, Janie. I'm just hungry belly. It just looks like such a good time. I, I want to. Uh, I want to eat some, and it was food, not just food, food. If you go to a powwow, you're definitely going to find Indian tacos. So I was about oh. to say that, Indian tacos. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the same concept as like a regular taco. Instead, it's homemade fry bread. So like they oh. fry bread up and they put everything on top of it, and it just takes it to another level. Oh, my oh, gosh. So good. Amina, try it. <laughs> oh, I will. <laughs> I'm on a mission now. I've got to say fish and anything that comes from like the land. I know we got tricked when we were younger to eat. I think it was moose stew. And when we were told it was beef and it was really chewy and we're like, um, this beef is funny. Like something was different about it. <laughs> um, so yeah, whatever you can hunt and, um, you know. I had the best fish I've ever put in my mouth at a powwow once. It was smoked trout. It was so good. Oh my goodness. There's so much stories about the smoked trout. My mother-in-law got a taste of it and wouldn't stop my dad. My dad was gifted from um, one of his uh, good friends on the reservation, gifted him some smoked trout. And my mother-in-law got a taste of it and she kept saying, go get more, go get more. And my dad's like, well, I can't really ask for more. It was like given as a gift. But yeah, I know what you're talking about. And the, the fresh that comes from the water fresh is just, is it's different. Like um, we have a private lake in Wasasink and they, my family, the guys would all go out fishing. It's called Three Mile Lake. And they would come back with like, I mean, a lot of fish so that we would have like a traditional uh, fish fry. And it was just unbelievable. And then one time I went to the store and bought frozen fish and I was like eating it and I was like, I taste dirt. I'm like, what does it taste like dirt? So I can't really eat the frozen fish because I'm so used to like fresh fish from the water. But yeah, those are so many got a different taste. Uh, yeah. Samara said that her favorite is scone dogs, Jamie. Oh, swan dogs. Okay. So same kind of concept. It's like a dough that is made. And then you take the hot dog and you wrap the dough in the hot dog and it gets fried. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like a pogo stick done native style so again takes it up a couple of levels <laughs> so, nice. so, so samira with that being said is that a hint to your mom to make some scone dogs then yeah this lady don't know how to make dough very well i tried this <laughs> are, are you talking is it like panic is it the same as panic yeah, it's the same kind of concept scone is like more like you know like tea biscuit kind of stuff that was my interpretation of scone. Yeah. My great grandmother yeah. used to make this, and sometimes she would put blueberries in it. And yeah, um, cranberries. <laughs> my daughter and I made uh, tried to make bannock once, but it turned out really good. We put cranberries in it; it was so good. Mm -hmm. See, that's different to make it kind of like a sweetness to it too. Oh my goodness, you guys have my belly <laughs> rumbling. So let's <laughs> 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 um. So indigenous.
commemorative and awareness days. So these are some days that you know you can take a screenshot of or just put them in your mind um, if you are a person that wants to support the Indigenous population. So we have National Indigenous Peoples Day, which is on June 21st. We have National Indigenous History Month, which is in June. And then we also have the International Day of the World Indigenous Peoples. And this is in August 9th. Hold on. We also have the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, September 30th, considered Orange Shirt Day. And this was new. Um, this is to recognize the, the, the children, the residential survivors, as well as the children that didn't make it home. Um, then we also have the National Day of Awareness for Missing, Murdered, Indigenous Women and Girls. And this is May 5th. Um, if anybody's unaware of any of these movements, uh, you can definitely ask questions. Um, I'm very passionate about both of them. And I feel like, you know, now they have a platform and now there's no denying um, what happened in history. So I feel as though we're embarking on um, change and um, I'm gonna remain hopeful with this. <laughs> Um, and then this is, they tried to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. Um, this was like a, a post that was going around the sites that I follow. And they're referring to the children that they found in the unmarked graves. Um, you know, sometimes it takes pain. Pain comes before, you know, the, the good. And I believe that, you know, all these babies that were buried and never made it home somehow, you know, are giving us this, this new, this new light, this new opportunity, this new ways, an opportunity for healing within the indigenous uh, population as a whole. Um, it, it's really disheartening at the same time, but, you know, there are many survivors that in my eyes, I look at as warriors and, you know, the indigenous population is still here. And I believe with the help of <laughs> the rest of the population, um, we can definitely make some changes that are desperately needed. And then finally, we are stronger together. And this is key. So I had a conversation with my my older brother today, and you know he lives, uh, he's lived on the the reserve his whole life, and there's just so much pain within the community amongst themselves, like anger and fighting, and you know it it's just it's so hard um, for these individuals to be able to rise above everything that they've gone through and they're going through. So if there's anything like you could do like us as a population is to show that support so that maybe you know they can see that and maybe they can start to change within their communities as well um i just wanted to thank each and every one of you for coming out and joining us tonight at healing connections healing connection a support light for better mental health um, I hope this was helpful and educational. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chim Miigwech, which means big thank you in Ojibwe. Miigwech. Miigwech. Chim Miigwech. Big thank you. Miigwech. Chim Miigwech. <laughs>